Good morning, everyone. This is Deborah Smith, editor of Rug Hooking Magazine. If you're looking for the webinar with Donna Herklin, you are in the right place. We'll be starting in just a few minutes when everyone has had a chance to connect. We'll be with you soon. I see a lot of people still signing in. We'll wait one more minute so everyone has a chance to join. We'll start the event at one minute past the hour. Good morning, everyone. This special event is brought to you by Rug Hooking Magazine. I'm Deborah Smith, editor of Rug Hooking Magazine, working from my home in South Central Pennsylvania in the midst of a sleet storm right now. I sure wish it was snow. As editor, I'm in touch with textile artists and rug hookers around the world to create five issues of Wooly Beauty each year for you. And I work with rug hooking authors, writers, and teachers like Donna Herkman to produce quality books. If you love rug hooking, you will love what we have to offer. We've been published since 1989, bringing you all the best from the world of rug hooking. We have a free newsletter called Rugby, five colorful print issues of RHM each year, and a book where we publish and present a hooking book from top-notch rug hooking artists and teachers. Be sure to check out everything that we have to offer. First, let's address a few housekeeping issues. If you get disconnected, you can reconnect using the same link. You will not be interrupting the talk. We are recording today's webinar, so if you have technical difficulties, don't worry. We'll send you a link and you can watch it later. And it will be posted on the RHM website very soon. We have enabled a Q&A feature for this event, so you can send in questions for Donna. Type them in and I'll ask Donna to answer as many as we have time for. If you'd like to order this book, visit the RHM website. We'll give you a link later. In fact, we'll send you all the links later when, you, when we send you the link to the video. You can use them at your convenience. Now it's time to meet Donna and give you a sneak peek into her new book. Many of you already know her having taken classes or workshops with her over the past several years. Or perhaps you've met her at Rug Hooking Week at Sauter Village, where she often teaches in August. She's dynamic and charming. And have you seen the cowboy boots? Have you seen those boots? Her boots are definitely made for walking, and the rest of us wish we could wear them the way she does. Donna is a teacher in high demand, so we are grateful to have her visit us via Zoom to talk about her new book. We'll start with a sneak peek into the book Shades, Tints, Tones, Values. One of Donna's recent rugs is this beauty, Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh. She'll be talking about it in a few minutes. There's a lot going on in this piece and you'll want to hear the story behind the rug. Look at the detail. What a, an amazing rendition of these little creatures. Shades, tints, tones, values, and Donna's amazing creativity and skill. How does she do that? Here's another spread from the book. Donna has memorialized one of her sons and his passion for his hometown in this gorgeous piece she calls Nick at Night. All Donna's rugs amaze me, but this one really blows me away. Just how do you show a cityscape running through a bushy beard? 
How do you show a silhouette in front of another silhouette? The question really is, how does Donna get those amazing ideas out of her head and into wool and onto the back end? It takes a whole lot of planning and a great deal of talent. Donna's book helps us to understand how she does it, and she gives us tips for our own hooked work. So we have the great privilege today of talking with Donna. We tracked her down at her home in wintry Dayton, Ohio, where she would rather be hooking rugs than shoveling snow. As Donna is talking, if you have a question, type it into the Q&A feature and we will get her to answer them as we have time. Good morning, Donna. Hi, Deb. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you, it's very exciting. Tell us a little bit about why you wanted to write this book. Well, I know a lot of people are interested in hooking a monochromatic rug um, and see it as a challenge uh, for me, but it's fun. And so when I started my first, I think my first major uh, monochromatic piece was the um, Native American boy that's on the cover of the book. And I hooked that in 2011. So it was really um, my first leap into a full-sized uh, piece that really explored contrast. And so to me, monochromatic, the key to it is the contrast. So, so how many shades, how many sh different shades, different values would you have in a rug like Christopher Robbins say? Well, Christopher Robin was different. Generally, I work uh, within an eight value range and die accordingly. Um, but with Christopher Robin, there was such, uh, it was a larger piece and it was also um, a lot more depth and medium values that I really wanted to accentuate uh, the contrast. And so there's 14 uh, different values in Christopher Robin. And I dyed that, I mixed the, that dye up um, after taking a jar of honey outside with my dye chart to so I could get the color of honey to do the, the basic layout and color for that rug. I imagine that's always a challenge to get all the different uh, values that you need in a monochromatic rug. Part of it is you have to, when you choose to do a rug that's monochromatic and not do it as an achromatic or black and white rug, or just a sepia rug where you have more range of warm, warm tones, you have to kind of teach your brain how to look at it. And so the more values you have where you can kind of combine them together to get those various uh, medium values, the better without going overboard. You don't, I don't need 50 values of something uh, to get the range that I like, but between probably six and, and 16 at the most. That's a pretty big range. Well, I think it depends on the size of the rug and the amount of detail that's involved in it. And in the original photo, um, there was a pretty good amount of, of those value changes. Uh, making sure that I could still get the textures because in his sweater, that's a different texture. Winnie the Pooh has a different texture, the trees, the leaves, all of those things have to work with the, the color palette uh, to be believable and look dimensional. When I was, oh, go ahead. Now, you know, when, I do a, when I do a rug, I always do a lot of research and especially on an historic piece like this, I really wanted to be accurate about Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin and, and their little connection to me is very special. The Winnie the Pooh books were favorites of mine when I was a kid and I loved that essentially what it comes down to is Winnie the Pooh is about friendship. And so what I wanted to do is capture that feeling between Christopher Robin and his bear, uh, as was exemplified in the stories. So for me, having the main characters be Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh, framed by elements uh, that you know from the books, it made it a more cohesive rug for me, a more storytelling rug. So the the setting is actually in the background is the hundred acre wood 
and that's a real place and it's still there. And I, I hooked it in really soft, foggy uh, values because I wanted it to be behind, you know, uh, in the background, but still have a sense of definition. And then with Christopher Robin and who, that's where you really need the larger amount of texture and um, direction of line to create the, the feeling of an actual sweater and to create that, you know, fuzzy bear look for Winnie the Pooh. And so having figured out those elements, I knew um, that I wanted to have the animals from the story. And in, in research, I realized that I needed to get um, a source of photos of those toys. So they actually are owned by the New York City Public Library. And I got permission and paid $50 for licensing uh, so I could use the images. And so those are laid out uh, kind of a bridge between the foreground and, and Christopher Robin and Pooh. So, so are, that's all important too. Are those little animals based on actual photos that you found or is that your own? Uh... Those are photos of the toys. They're the actual toys. What's funny is um, Eeyore's as big a toy as Winnie the Pooh is. He's a very large stuffed animal. And Piglet is teeny. He's very little. And so I wanted to have Piglet be bigger and more significant because he was Winnie the Pooh's best friend. Also, uh, Kanga, the stuffed animal Kanga, um, when Christopher Robin was on an outing at an apple orchard, he lost Roo out of the pocket. And so there is no baby Roo actually there. So I, I couldn't stand that. <laughs> I was so sad that I put a Roo in there of my own making, so. <laughs> That completed the set. I'm glad you did. <laughs> artistic, uh, um, artistic ability to make the world right. Correct. <laughs> That's right. A sense of I would just didn't want Kanga going through life without her little baby in there. So back to the texture in Pooh and the texture in Christopher Robin's sweater. Is Pooh all? Uh, wool strips, there's no yarn or other um, textured differences in, in no. who? This, this whole rug is hooked with wool strips in a number three cut. All number so, three. Yeah, so the manipulation of how you create those textures is having, you know, six or seven or eight values. Uh, so you get light bits that reflect uh, the light highlights of the fur, and you have dark shadowy bits that indicate where, you know, the fur, you know, is tucked in. And so also it was really important to me to get this line of vision between them because it's like this bond that you see just in the photo. And I wanted to make sure I had that in the rug too, because to me that says that's the heart of the rug is how much they, he loved his, his bear. And so... Yeah. And how much the bear loved um, Christopher. That's right, that's right. Um, in terms of the trees for the, for the framing, um, I did some research of course on that. And in the 100 acre wood, there are primarily uh, elm trees and oak trees. And so I hooked one of each. Um, this is the oak tree. So I looked at oak trees to see what the bark looks like, what the leaves look like. And then I looked at elm trees again to see what the bark looks like and what the leaves look like. So those are as accurate a representation of those textures um, as I felt was necessary. Also at the top, the banner at the top, um, I looked up the original uh, Winnie the Pooh books and the first ones that came out just had like a manila uh, colored cover, just a solid color uh, with that template shape uh, for the title. And it just uh, was Winnie the Pooh. So I added Christopher Robin as this was the rug that connects the two of them in the same typeface. So that's all hooked as the original book uh, title would have looked in there. 
So the trees you have in there are all bot botanically correct. I mean, I don't know how to say that, but they're, they're trees that are actually in the hundred acre wood and you did the yes. research. Right? Yes. And, so it, and the leaves are, um, the elm, uh, the elm leaves are hooked with a lot of uh, tunneling to get those really tiny lines. So you can see the veins of the leaves without having them be too big or too fat uh, to indicate the texture of the leaves. Yeah, I, I like that you have trees on either end that are overarching to the top. And yeah. what I really love is the softness of the trees in the background. That's uh, very clever, Donna. Very nice. Well, you know, we know that things in the foreground have to be sharper and more defined and more textured. And when you want something to recede into the background, it has to be softer and later less defined. That's also the fact that the hundred acre wood is foggy often, you know, during the, during the year, uh, that helps with that illusion and also authenticity as well. Yes, that's a uh, that's a masterpiece. What what's going to happen to this rug? Do you have a plan for it? I do. Uh, Pre-COVID, I uh, had an arrangement to meet with our local downtown public library to talk about uh, donating it to the library. Uh, the last year and a half kind of threw a monkey wrench into that because they've been closed and then they were open on a limited basis, and so I really need to soon. Uh, get back with them, uh, talk about how to display it and, uh, and what we need to do to get it there. That's really where I would like it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be nice to have <clears throat> it in a place where lots and lots of people see it and appreciate it for the great art it is, but to also learn more about rug hooking and the wonderful things that can be done. Exactly. Like somebody, you're doing. Um, that's, that's, pretty nice. So you have to your to your right, to your left, you have another rug. Yes. You have Nick. <laughs> There's Nick. Nick at night. Good yeah. looking guy. He's, um, you know, when I first was rug hooking, people would say, have you hooked your kids? And I was always, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to. And then, it just didn't seem like a thing I had to do. I, I don't know. It just was something I just was dismissive of. Then uh, Nick sent me a picture. Have, I'm sorry. The, have the real thing. Why do you need to have a hook? Exactly. Rendition? Exactly. <laughs> I got them. I don't need to hook them. But uh, Nick sent me a picture that he, he had taken, uh, someone had taken of him at a, uh, one of his events downtown. And I was just like, oh, man. Now I have to hook Rug. <laughs> I have to hook Nick. But you know, be, just because you have a really good portrait of someone, a good photo or a good source of someone, doesn't mean you have to hook it just like that because you already have a good photo. What do you need to hook it for? So my goal then was to really capture Nick's personality and, and create a tribute to him that I thought was really represented him and told a little bit about him. And so I encourage rug hookers um, when they're designing rugs or creating their own things to incorporate elements that help personify what they're doing. There's little things about this rug, about Nick, more than just him, you know, being a downtown guy. He lives in downtown Dayton. He works uh, for the Dayton Daily Newspaper. And, um, he socializes. There's a, an historic district downtown where he uh, loves to hang out with his friends. So for me, it was assembling all of the things that I know about Nick and that make him who he is that um, let me kind of play with this. So his favorite color always was blue. When he was a little boy, he loved blue. So that was the the color choice made easy. Um, it's downtown Dayton, you see in the background. And also, uh, I wanted to create him 
as part of Dayton and Dayton as part of him, not just standing in front of it or, you know, just surrounded by it. I wanted him to be part of it. And so that was for this rug, the biggest challenge. Um, hooking architecture and geometric shapes into organic elements like his beard, that was the hardest part. Um, you did. It's amazing to me. That's just astounding. And it worked. I mean, it yeah. absolutely, yeah. Thanks. Well, it's, it just was then a give and take. And the balance is, was the hardest part to make sure that it didn't turn into just a solid skyline, but at the same time, it didn't become just his, you know, just his beard. So that little in between uh, was the tricky part. Also, um, getting a, a background that was had movement, but not so much movement that it detracted from the portrait. There are other little personal things about this. This is the the river that runs under the bridges downtown. And they always, the old saying is that still waters run deep. And in Nick's case, that's pretty true. He's pretty, he's a pretty um, deep personality, very, very smart. And um, so I wanted the river to be a part of it. And um, the crescent moon, I like the idea of the crescent moon. And there's the Big Dipper in, the, in there. And that has the North Star in the Big Dipper. And I wanted Nick to have a guiding star. Also in across in this, you can just barely see it. There's um, the constellation in the sky and that's his sign, that's Gemini. So there are little elements of Nick's personality in here. And when you're creating a rug, you can do that. And it doesn't have to be obvious. It doesn't have to be a big, you know, it can just be between you and, and that person, what those elements mean. How this must have been one of your rugs that necessitated the high higher number of values. Am I correct? No. I mean, I'm looking. No. Yeah. Eight values. Yeah. I mean, you've got the dark, dark, dark in some of those buildings, and the white, 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 or some of the clouds, and it seems like every possible shade in between. But you're telling me you just have to know how you're doing it to get it to work. It is, and it's combining them. For example, in the sky, there really aren't that many values, but they're, they're close values. And so you get a sense of, you can still see elements and you can track the movement. There's kind of a curvy, swervy um, texture going on, but nothing so distinct that it takes you out of the background or has the background become too junky or cluttery. It's just enough values. And there's really not that much value shift between the sky and his hair. It just, I put a little tunneled edge of light uh, against the back of his hair so it didn't get, you know, sucked into the background. So he doesn't, he's not meant to just jump right out. He's supposed to have kind of a sense of, of um, being part of it. And he, he absolutely is a part of it. So one of the questions we got here is, did Donna die over textured wool as well as natural wool? I have. I, as a rule, I don't because I use such a fine cut that uh, textured wools can fall apart. Also, I am kind of a purist in uh, dyeing monochromatic that I like having the same texture all the way through. Uh, and that kind of, because even when I'm creating something like Winnie the Pooh, where he has a lot of physical texture of the furry texture. I didn't feel the need to to use a textured wool, but rather just used a you know the the texture of how the direction of line, how to make it look like it. Wow, wow. <clears throat> so Christine asks, I assume you dye your own wool. What technique do you use to dye? I do dye my own wool. Uh, I have a dye kitchen that is my kitchen. Uh, nothing fancy, nothing special. I do, I use eight of the dye spoons uh, and that's how I uh, come up with my eight values plus white. 
So that's, um, it's pretty the lazy person's way to, to get eight values because mm -hmm. you just use the spoons. And so I just start off with the color. Generally, I will just pick a, a solid color. I don't generally blend. I blended um, for uh, Winnie the Pooh and I blended dyes for the, um, the women's voices suffragette rug. But this, you know, this is a solid blue. It just makes it easier. And I like having the less fuss and less problems with controlling color. Well, first of all, no one would ever call you lazy, but that's beside the point. Here's a question from Susan Sutherland. Does Donna use natural by itself as a non-color? No, I use the white, door white. Natural wool works great for over dyes of color generally speaking, however, it has a vanilla cast to it. And so if you dye uh, blue over it, there's this a hint of green that comes up because of the, the background color. So I use dwarf white. I have a couple of questions regarding the tunneling that you were talking about on the Christopher Robin rug. Can you explain what that is? Well, you know, I... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's a thing. Uh, I asked what it is. It's a technique where you hook, uh, you hook your rows, you fill, fill in a space, and then you come back in with another strip and you pull it up in between rows. You have to have rows in place uh, to, to finagle it in, but then you pull up just a teeny edge and you, when you pull up the loop, instead of having it bolt full on, you turn it sideways. And so it fits in just in a little teeny space in between. And you don't hook it all the way to the surface. You just keep it down a little bit. And so what that does is it gives you a, a, not only a little edge of color for contrast, but a little shadow. So you have this, um, these little fine lines. A lot of them are in its beard too, um, where the color is just there as, as an accent. Um, Chris Butler is one of my favorite people, great rug hooker, of course, and fantastic teacher, wonderful artist. And I asked her, I said, Chris, this technique where you pull up in between these little teeny lines, is that called tunneling? And she said, honey, call it whatever you want to. <laughs> But I think the majority of people who know what tunneling is, that's what it is. Chris. <laughs> okay, well, another question on uh, Nick at Night. Did you use Photoshop or other photo manipulation software to superimpose Nick on your background? I did not. That's a good question. I uh, draw on tracing paper. When I'm laying out a design, I draw everything on tracing paper. And in this case, I did a drawing based on a photo of downtown Dayton on one piece of tracing paper. And then I drew Nick's portrait out on another piece. So that gave me these two uh, manipulating pieces to work with because that, that was tricky also because I wanted the, the, the skyline to be, you know, contained within the image, but I didn't want it up in his face because that would have broken up his face, but then I didn't want it just low because then it would lose the effect of him being part of it. So I just moved the tracing paper drawings uh, back and forth over each other until I found a combination that I liked and then took a third piece of tracing mm -hmm. paper and then traced it all out as a single uh, pattern drawing. So for a rug that's this complex, I still can't wrap my head around it, Donna, but for a rug complex, which is the, I don't want to say hardest, but which is the most time intensive or, or brain stretching, the layout and the figuring it out or the actual hooking when you get to having to choose the values and the tints and the tones? I know it's they're different. That may not be a fair question, but it's too it, it, it's a fair know. question. But it's a it's a it is a two part thing. First, the ideas come, and you know I try to incorporate as many things in there as I can without it getting cluttery or junky. And then um, once I have the layout, uh, I'm already thinking 
about, okay, what's going to be the darkest part? What's going to be the lightest part? Um, based uh, on my reference photos of downtown and my reference photo of Nick, how can I distinguish between the contrast I need for the brightness or the dullness or the detail? And so I'm already thinking in terms of that as I'm drawing it, like where, what are the dark parts going to be? When you hook a monochromatic rug, some people say, oh, is, is it boring? Uh, it's really not. Even though you're not working with a range of color, you're still working with um, creating a three-dimensional looking uh, mm -hmm. image. And it's, it's more of a challenge. It's not harder. It's just different than if you were hooking this in full color. I don't think this would be uh, good in full color. It, was, it lends itself as a monochromatic because then it allows you to, your eye to, to do the blending and to do that um, transition without uh, trying to read it as an actual photo. It just points out how um, reliant rug hookers often are on color when really it's the values and the tints and the shades and the tones that right. the great piece. Um, that's, that's, uh, so for this piece, I know you're probably going to try to avoid this question, but approximately how many different shades of blue did you use? Um, I mean, it looks to me like it's about... It's just, <laughs> you're it's telling probably, me. There's eight plus white. Just eight? Yeah. Only eight? Yep. Frank so. <laughs> and that's why you're Donna. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. There's really very little, uh, very few areas that are a solid color, like a solid tone or so a solid value. Everything's blended. So you get by doing that, by combining uh, more darks together and then incorporating some mediums, you, you, it's like you triple the amount of values that you have because it's how you combine them. So when you talk about hooking multiple values together, does that mean close together or pulling them up together through the linen? Oh, no, no, not pulling them up together, just hooking them close together. So it gives you a sense of um, like in the sky, for example, I'll hook the dark, a dark value to establish the pattern. So it's in this case, it's little S's and little curly Q's. Then I'll hook next to it the second value from that and then maybe the third. And so what happens is they all start to bump into each other and you get a real, um, you get a more of a feeling for how, how you can adjust one, uh, one area that isn't just flat. It doesn't go flat on you because you've got all those little values mixed in. Yeah, the clouds uh, look like a really good example of that. Those are so dimensional. Yeah. And that's a law of contrast where you don't, these are still curly and, and curvy lines up in the sky, but when you look in the clouds, um, because you use the whitest value, the lightest value of white and the darker value um, in between, you get a lot more uh, impact. Yes. Uh, Martha asks a question that I wondered about. Was it difficult to bind the irregular top of Nick's rug? Nah, it's not that hard. Um, when I bind, I trim within an inch of the finished hooked area and trim off all the excess. And in this case, it's just a little bit wavy and bumpy. And so you just kind of follow that um, on the linen and then it's, I wrap it over uh, cotton cording. I think three sixteenths usually, and just wrap it over that and pin it and then whip it with the yarn. And I dye the yarn to match uh, the color in the rug also. Okay, Rosario asks about Nick's eyes. What cut did you use for the eyes? And when did you hook them before the glasses in the face? They are alive. Thanks. Um, they're a, a three, same as everything. Uh, in this rug also all hooked in threes. I always hook the eyes first um, because if you get the eyes right in a portrait, then the rest of the face will follow along. 
it seems like, as they say, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And for me, once the eyes are right, and that's, uh, that's a jumping off point to do the rest. So then I'll generally work in a triangle. I'll get the eyes first and then the nose and then the mouth. And then Nick's case, I kind of stopped because I wasn't ready to tackle that beard thing uh, right at that point. So eyes, um, glasses, ears, forehead, those all came before I dove into this part. Um, people worry about hooking glasses and you really don't have to. What you need to remember about glasses is that for one thing, I've worn glasses my whole life. So a portrait or a photo of me without glasses doesn't look like me. So don't leave them off. Uh, if it's something that the person always has glasses, then you need to put them on. And in Nick's case, he had that, um, the dark top and then the very light uh, lower frame on his glasses. And so what you do when you hook them then is to just minimalize that. Don't, don't just hook one big solid line, do a broken line where you have a little bit of light, a little bit of medium, a little bit of light, and it still defines the shape of the glasses, but it doesn't turn into like goggles. Mm -hmm. uh, besides value, do you also consider temperature and saturation to get depth and volume? Well, I think when you uh, have the wool uh, in front of you and you've dyed up this range of, of values, you can assess how deep uh, the areas of certain areas of the rug are going to be. You know, things that are, uh, in this case, the architecture that is very rigid and very solid needed to be dark because that gave me something to play the clouds off of. And so the intensity of color uh, or value um, has to make sense when you see it combined with the other elements. Sandra Brown asked a question about the uh, measuring spoons. She said, you mentioned eight measuring spoons to get eight values. What size spoons are they over how much wool for each value? Getting deep in the wood. <laughs> They're the standard, I don't know the name of them. Uh, dye spoons that start at a teaspoon and then a half and then a quarter and the eighth, the sixteenth, a thirty-second, a one sixty-fourth, uh, and a one one twenty-eighth. And so that's the the range of the spoons. And then I use white as the 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 lightest value. Um, I, I, I dye over half yard pieces. I soak the wool overnight so you don't get any uh, Oreos you right. know, on the outside and light on the inside. So the, the wool's all fully soaked and accepts the dye. And um, I start with, I have four burners on my stove that will accommodate pots. And so I will dye the first four lightest values first, the first eight of those, the first four, um, and start with the lightest because that goes quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Dump those, fill the pots, go back and hook the second, uh, the second set of four, including the darkest. Now those obviously take longer because the dye is darker. Um, but yeah, that's it. It's like I said, it's so simple. <laughs> it's lazy. <laughs> So you would normally dye uh, all of the wool for a rug in, in one shot, one day? Yes, because yes. that's consistency. Anyone who's dyed knows that water temperature, and then if you have city water, you don't know how much uh, chemical changes take place over a week or a month or any amount of time. It just seems to me to have more control and more consistency if you do it all in one day, all in one, you know, dye day. So from the intricate dye questions back to the very basics here, we have a couple of questions um, for those just starting out mm -hmm. wanting to dye monochromatics. Is it easier to start off with fewer values when you're learning monochromatic? And a related question that we got before the uh, before today even is um, Debbie has a pattern from Holly Hill Designs but she says she's intimidated. The pattern is a stylized flower urn with stylized 
trees and animals, kind of like a cool piece, uh -huh. uh, but she wants to do it in monochromatics. How does one determine where to place the values of the wool in a monochromatic design? So those two questions are sort of sort of related with some basic right. information for those just starting out. If you have a design that is not uh, uh, color planned or has an indication of color, for example, if it's just a line drawing, <laughs> what I recommend doing is take a picture of it and print it out on paper and then sit with um, a colored pencil that you like. Uh, I want to do green. So I get a green colored pencil and then lay in some color. Uh, in different areas on that on that drawing and tell you, okay, I like this being dark because this will make these little dogs show up. And then I like this being medium because if this is in the background, it shouldn't be that dark. And that way you can kind of puzzle it together um, and then, you know, step back from it and say, oh, okay, it needs more dark somewhere or it needs more medium somewhere. Uh, in terms of how many values you need, uh, here's the thing. You start off with three or four, and then you're you're hooking it, and you're like, man, I need something in between these two. That's why I, six to me would be a minimum because that gives you uh, a nice enough range that you should have a, a very light and a dark, and then uh, four uh, little value shifts in between. Again, you can you can die infinite levels, just grain by grain, you can end up with 50 values, but they get hard to tell apart at a certain point. And for me, uh, whatever that point is, there's no need to go, you know, an extra five or six values, just, you know, enough that you can use them, uh, combine them and have light, medium and dark uh, without, uh, without a lot of extra stuff you don't need. So for those just starting off, it would be easy to purchase pre-dyed wool from Swatch It. Swatch oh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. And most of those are done in, you know, numbered swatches. So you can see the, the range of value shifts from the very lightest to the very darkest. Uh, that's that's an easy, an easy way to go. Well, here's a, here's a comp another complicated question for you. Uh, Kimberly wonders, how do you train your eyes to see the values in the photo and consistently match them to the eight values of your wool? That, that's, a, that's a good trick. How do you do that? Well, it, to me, it's hard for me because I have that background. Uh, as a painter, I've always been able to do that. But you can teach yourself what to look for. And if you have a source, especially if you have a color source, Manip you know, put it in Photoshop or do whatever you want to and make it monochromatic if that helps you. And then you can even, you know, have it be done in a color, a monochromatic range in a color. Just because I don't have to do that doesn't mean it's not a bad, it's not a bad thing to do. Do it. Do what you need to. Then assess. One thing that I will do with any photo that I'm working for as a source is I will assess this. I will say, what's the darkest part of this image? What's the lightest part of this image? And then how do they get connected? So for me, when I actually go to hook it, I will often hook the darkest things first uh, because it gives me a sense of structure. The dark areas in a rug to me represent an underlying uh, building block. And then if you then go back and put in the lightest things, then you can see what you need to bridge in between. So you'll have your very darkest bits and then you'll have your lightest bits and you'll say, okay, what's, this is my reference point. This, this building is my reference point for what's the darkest thing. And then I think, think what's the lightest thing? It's gonna be the elements in Nick's face. And so then you say, okay, how do I get from here to here? And that's where you look at that source and it says, okay, there's a, there's a highlight that runs at a certain point. There's a shadow that runs at a certain point and you just build. It's almost like a process of literally building something where you have one set area and then you add to it to get to the to the next area 
that makes sense. Yes, it does. Are there any colors that don't work too well for a monochromatic piece? Um, I favor uh, traditional sepia, you know, golden browns, black and white as an achromatic rug, and purple works good. I've done that, greens, blues. What doesn't work are colors that you have trouble getting contrast with. For example, yellow is hard because you can go from gold to bright yellow, but there's not a real deep yellow that gives you enough contrast on something. Reds make good contrast, but you have to be careful because in the lightest values, they're pink and it can turn into a skin tone kind of thing. So you don't necessarily, red may not work as well because, it, because of the pink that you end up with. Do you ever do a painting sketch first? Um, yes. Actually, I don't paint it. I do colored pencils. Um, I have a project coming up after uh, the Wright Brothers rug that I'm working on that will incorporate, that will be a color, a full color rug. But again, it's a combined image, kind of like with Nick. So there's no uh, one photo that I'm working from as a reference. And so I've done a color pencil layout for that. Going back to um, some of your other rugs, well, this would include Christopher Robin, I think. Um, you like to do a lot of um, um, rugs with a purpose, rug with a rugs with a message. Yeah, that's another thing known for. Uh, how do you handle copyright issues with Christopher Robin? I know that you, you know, spend a lot of time making sure that you did it exactly right. Copyright right. is such a big issue for uh, rug hookers art. All, all artists, but right. uh, including rug hookers. So can you give us some hints on what you do, how you do it, what would be important for us all to consider? Essentially, what I've learned over the, over the years is that if you can get your own source, take your own photos, work from your original things yourself without relying on borrowed images, do that. Because that just takes all of the question out of it. Now, in a case like with Christopher Robin, I did uh, contact the library and ask them, okay, I've seen your photos of the toys online and I would be interested in, in using them, not as they are in the photo, but manipulating them for this composition. And they were fine. They said, pay us 50 bucks and you can use the image ever how you need to. So that, I think it all comes down to asking if you're using a photo that is credited to someone else to, to go to the source and say, I often will send a photo of what my rug, one of my rugs, for example. When I was doing the Steampunk Poly, the green monochromatic rug, there was a photo of the building that I used on her hat. And so I contacted the people with the hat, uh, with the building and said, I'm a rug hooker. And I sent them a photo of the Steampunk rug and said, this is the work that I do. I would like very much to use the image of this little house in a, in a new rug I'm working on. And they were very flattered. They said, sure, go ahead and be sure and send us a photo when it's done. So in terms of that, in terms of using a photo from uh, a, a, you know, a published source or something that you've seen online, go to the source and ask. Nine times out of 10, they're more than happy and they're flattered to use it. Now, in terms of photos that have been in print, eh, that really does get tricky because there are, um, and I don't know if it's just hearsay or, but 70 years past the, the death of the photographer or artist, their work becomes available to the public. You can find work, more contemporary work in public domain. I, I think it comes down to having a specific choice and, and following up on it, contacting the, where you saw it published or if you can get a hold of the original uh, source. 
uh, go with that and, and just always get permission when you can. I know you have the woman's voices rugs, rug there with you too. So yeah. or, let's talk a little bit about that one. Okie doke. What, what this? <laughs> this <laughs> <other> thing? <laughs> Okay, all right, so we're talking about monochromatic rugs and here I see purple and I see yellow. Yes. That's not mono. It is not. I call it duochromatic because I'm a fresh new thinker and that's what I like. Um, I originally planned to do it in purple because the suffragettes um, had purple and gold as their, their color scheme when they did posters, when they did, they had, um, florets and and boutonnieres and things like that and that was their and their banners were purple and gold uh initially i was just going to do purple and then i thought man this doesn't seem like it's got enough oomph to it and it's not dramatic enough and i really wanted it to have some kind of drama because this was a big deal and so i decided that i would dye a uh, monochromatic purple uh with one uh color and then dye a monochromatic set of, of yellows. So technically there are two sets of monochromatic colors in this rug and it allows me to um, represent different areas and create a balance between the two which was really important uh, in the composition to have a balance of of the brightness of the gold without overpowering the deepness of the purple. So what's your favorite part of that rug? I'll, I'll tell you what my favorite part is. My favorite part is, is the, the line of women lining up to vote, which tell us a little bit about that, Donna. Okay, well, this was a challenge. It was fun though. Um, again, I did some uh, looking around into clothing because I wanted uh, all of the generations to be represented from their right to vote in 1920 up through now. And so that would have made, if I did every decade, that would have made too many people. So I went with every, every 20 years. And so they're represented 1920 through 2020. And if you look, um, their clothing is, is kind of represents the decades that they uh, are there to represent. So you've got, you know, the, the 20s, uh, style and and then the 40s and then the 60s with her mini skirt and then the 80s remember when all, all we had puff sleeves and long skirts yep. and and then the two that in 2000 it was a uh, uh, suits were big and then now it's kind of like oh well okay whatever it worked <laughs> um and you can see i tried to incorporate a lot of values for those as well so they didn't just all blend into one uh you know one blob of, of person. Also, I incorporated a little teeny bit of yellow in uh, the dresses. So there's a little sense of continuity as it works across that line um, to get them all included uh, in the in the pattern. And the lettering on the ballot box is in the yellow too. So it's a, a nice um, a nice line from the voters to the ballot box, which Nice message, nicely done, really nice. My favorite part is her. She was a tough cookie. <laughs> she really was. And she was dedicated. Um, Susan B. Anthony was very dedicated to the cause and, and stood up for women's rights, not just for voting, but for education as well and, and care. And so um, that's why I wanted to frame her uh, as the as the main character of the rug, so to speak. She's the she's the star. And when I was designing the layout for this, I added the um, gold roses because they would wear rosettes uh, as part of their uh, protests or parades or whatever they were taking part in for publicity. And then I thought. You know, she to focus uh, on the, in a design, you can change the layout uh, from a traditional rectangle to put an arch on something. And by putting an arch on a rug, it gives you it it contains the space better. 
to do that. Um, it contains the space and the focus. So you get visually, your eyes are pulled into uh, that part of the image that you really want to highlight. Important parts, no excess background. <clears throat> exactly. Also, the lettering, um, the lettering in this is uh, 1920s kind of Art Deco. So if you're if you're laying out a piece that has historical significance, if you're doing a traditional rug where you're incorporating language or words, um, and you want to make it more authentic and and really lend more uh, value to it make sure that you include the right kind of, uh, of text and lettering, whatever that style is. Well, here's a question for you. Are you gonna be teaching any classes in the Dayton area? In the Dayton area, yes. I teach, I'm a member of a Beaver Creek Guild, Beaver Creek, Ohio. Um, and so we have, uh, I'm lined up to teach in June at a workshop. And I generally will teach, I have in the past teach uh, in January, uh, a couple of weekend uh, little deals up there. Okay. So that's the Dayton area thing. Well, we're running out of time, Donna. I think we could keep talking to you all day long, but I think you have some snow that you probably need to shovel. Yes. So we will um, finish up here. <clears throat> We've all missed taking classes and attending hook-ins while we're dealing with COVID. So it's a special treat having you to talk with about your new book. It's a great one and I think it will become a classic. So we're pleased to offer this book to book club members at a special price of $22.95. If you're not a member of the book club yet, you can join online at rughookingmagazine.com slash new book. We have some great books coming up. So we hope you join us and uh, take a look at them too. A special offer for you today, we're offering you a discounted price on Donna's two earlier books. Use the promo code you see on the screen, DHM60, order on the RHM website. And we have a special deal for the magazine. This is an introductory offer for new subscribers. Get yourself a subscription to RHM for $19.95 for five issues available to those watching today. Use the code you see on the screen, the webinar deal code. A few notes before we end today, this is our seventh webinar. As a response to the pandemic, we at Rug Hooking Magazine started this series so that we could visit you and send you wonderful rug hooking information. Click into our webinars for some fun and to meet other interesting rug hooking personalities. Our rug hooking webinar in August featured several celebration winners interviewed by Jean Shepard. That event's a great way to capture a behind the scenes glimpse of celebration artists and their work. The most recent webinar was with Molly Colgrove, the author of our Art of Hooked Rug Landscapes. And there are bound to be more, so stay tuned. Remember to look for an email soon with a link to today's webinar after it has been posted online. That email will include the links to the deals we talked about today. So in conclusion, thank you so much to Donna for taking that time out of her busy, busy life to talk to us about her new book. I love that we can visit with all of our favorite rope hooking artists in their creative spaces and talk to them in person. And finally, a great big thank you to everyone for coming to our online events. We appreciate your interest and your participation and we look forward to seeing you again at the next webinar. And I really hope we can start seeing each other face to face soon. Until then, stay safe. Stay healthy. Keep on hooking. Goodbye, everyone. Can't wait to see you all. Bye.